First off, thank you all for being flexible today and meeting online. Um, those of you who were planning on going in, I know some of you couldn't make it in to class anyway, which is why we did this switch. Um, but hopefully nobody's life got too messed up by it. And for you future people who weren't able to attend right now, thank you for joining the YouTube. All right, so uh, before we get into today's topic, which is written on the board, we will be, I just wanna quickly discuss a couple business points. So first business point, you have a homework due the end of tomorrow. It is the social psychology assignment, basically the go online, find four different advertisements and write up a few sentences explaining how that advertisement, be it audio or a video or a picture, demonstrates one of the various <clears throat> social psychology principles that we talked about in Social Psychology Day. Uh, if you need an extension, just ask. This is our sixth and final of the regular ordinary homeworks. Um, Again, do end of day tomorrow, but again, if it's a little past, I'm not going to take off. Uh, the other thing I want to say is about the final three, I guess we only have after this, only three assignments for the rest of the semester. Um, the three assignments we have are going to be a thesis assignment, they are going to be a outline assignment, and then it's going to be the final paper. And so, um, I have now officially, I know, Dandre, I know you asked about it, and so I just wanted to let everyone know, the final paper prompts are now up online if you want to look at what the final paper is. It's not due for over a month. I think it's not even, it's not due for like six weeks, but if you want to get started and look at what the prompts are, they are now posted up there. Also, if you want to um, take a look at what the two lead up assignments are, the thesis assignment and the outline assignment and see what you're being asked to do on those. Those are also now posted online. So if you wanna take a look at what the assignments are, we haven't talked about any of the material they will be about yet, but if you're interested in that stuff, it's up there now, all right? Just posted, it, there's a new little blurb on the left side of the blackboard that just says like paper stuff. Um, so if you want to get started on it, it's there. And if you want to talk to me about anything you see on there, I'm happy to do so. All right. Any other business questions, comments, concerns? All right. In that case, we are now going to go. Oh, Netta, did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask, that, does that mean that like we technically didn't learn yet what those papers are going to be about? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So the four prompts, one of them is about cultural relativism, which we'll be discussing next week. One of them is about privacy and um, the modern age, which will be coming up the following week. One of them is about the internet and democracy, and one of them is about the internet and hate speech. So those are going to be our four possible topics. And then also, I didn't include it on there, but if you want to write on your own topic, you're also welcome to. But um, yeah, we have not gone over any of those things yet. So it might be a little difficult to write on them, but if you do the readings and you talk to me ahead of time, you should be able to do it. Um, it should be in theory possible, but I'm not suggesting you should or have to. The first assignment isn't due until December 2nd. The second one is due December 7th. And then the final paper I think is due like the 15th or the 19th or something like that. Um, the date is on there. I just can't remember what it is off the top of my head. Um, all right. Any other businessy questions? If not, we can jump into the topic for today. Okay. So our topic today is written up here. Ethics. Out of curiosity, how many of you have seen this word before? Good, okay. Is there anyone who's like never seen it, completely unfamiliar with it? Um, so yeah. This is going to be the topic, because remember, if you go back, this class was called Ethics and Critical Thinking. We spent the first half of the semester just discussing the critical thinking half. The rest is either going to be about the ethics half or about how to write a paper on the ethics half. So the remainder of what we're doing is going to entirely be ethics related. So the first question I want to ask then is, what is ethics? Those of you who have seen the word or come across it, Either can you give me a definition of it? Can you give me examples of it? Can you give me some things you've heard about it? Just anything about ethics that you feel 
you are confident that is it somehow related to it? Corinne. Um, is it like the study about what's morally right? That's exactly the definition, study of morality. So that's the definition of it, is the study of morality. But then you can ask the question, what the hell does that mean? What is this morality thing? What is it to, like, we know ethics studies morality, but what is morality? Um, Corin just brought up the first thing, which is it has to do with what's morally, I think you used right, didn't you? Did you say morally right, Corin? I think you said morally right. Or mo all right. Morally right. Lauren, you just raised your hand. Yeah, I was going to say, like, morals being the difference between right and wrong, like good or bad. It's about what's right and what's wrong. And it's also about what's good and what's bad. Good versus bad, right versus wrong. So these are the sorts of things that morality is looking at. So ethics is the study of the principles by which we decide what's right and what's wrong, or what's a good thing or what's a bad thing. Or it can be much more applied. So morality also concerns very particular sorts of questions. Things like, is murder ever justified? or um, should, I don't know, give, give me some other ethical questions or moral questions that you've come across in your everyday life. They can be big picture ones, small picture ones, just anything we can add to the examples of moral questions. Is so, okay to, oh, let's go Netta first, then Lauren. Is it okay to steal to yeah. for, you know? Is it ever okay to steal? That's a really good one. Um, that's like the whole point of Les Mis. Uh, anybody, Lauren, you had one. Yeah, like, um, is a death penalty warranted? Yeah, is it, is it ever okay to have a death penalty or should it be gotten rid of in all situations? That's another good one, death and I don't know how to spell penalty. That might be right. Um, is killing your girlfriend justified if she cheated on you? That is an ethical question for sure. Um, another one is, just generally speaking, is killing ever justified? Um, what are some other ones? Come on, the you've police. all encountered oh. the conservative life. Lauren, sorry, I spoke over you. So, I'm so sorry. Um, no, it could it be like um, the, um, the trolley, you know, the trolley the question? Trolley problem. Um, we'll be discussing yeah. that one a lot more next week, so I won't talk about it too much. But yeah, the trolley problem, that's a really good one. This can be really extreme one. So Kosi's one of, is your girlfriend cheated? If your girlfriend cheated, are you allowed to kill this individual? Like, it, I know it's an absurd case in which we all kind of know that the, the answer is no. But even if the answer is obviously no, it doesn't change the fact it's a moral question. Um, Abortion is another one. Is it ever justified for a woman to have an abortion, regardless of what your views on it are? Um, it's clearly an example of a moral issue that people argue about. Corinne. Um, uh, I thought it was really interesting how you brought out how, um, you know, even if it's something that seems obvious at first, um, it's still a moral issue because I had another professor um, when I was a journalism major and it's actually one of the uh, like main factors that prompted me to stop being a journalism major. And this guy is actually really, really um, like in a good position. He's the head writer for politics um, or the online section of a major news um, organization, think like MSNBC, that kind of thing. Um, and he's a professor at Brooke. And he posed like with a completely straight face like, is it okay for a police officer to shoot someone in the back who's, you know, running away? And he didn't even seem to realize that that, like, posing it as a question, like, that's something that I think to a lot of people would be, like, obvious, but he's like, ah, you have to act like it's an equal choice. And even choosing to present something in that way is making a moral statement, like, there's a possibility it's allowed, right? Yeah, so I think, and I think one thing that's really interesting to bring up in this context is the interactions between a descriptive case and an ethical way of looking at the exact same question. So I think one thing that people really want to try, and I think like ideally in a news world, you'd be able to present the news in a way in which you separated the facts from the ethical considerations. But I think the fact of the matter is that 
most ethical questions or most issues are taking place in a society in which even describing the very facts is going to have ethical implications. And like, I mean, there's been all these sorts of studies on things even, and this is something we didn't talk about last time because we just went over the midterm, but even things like whether you use passive or active voice. So by that, I mean, um, I killed so and so versus so and so was killed. People have very different feelings on this sort of thing. So I think, well, like ideally, and I can understand from a journalistic standpoint, if somebody truly believes that the goal of journalism is to prevent, present the facts in as unbiased a way as possible, why you would want to approach it in this way. But I agree with like your gut feeling that there's just certain sorts of issues that are just so to the very core having... Um, like they, they have ethical, like you cannot separate the ethics out of them in certain ways, just because these things are so ingrained in our society, just the way they're framed are by their very nature ethical issues. So I think, I mean, the question of like that question of, is it ever okay to shoot someone in the back? That is an ethical question that is like, in theory, at the very least, you could say, yes, there are situations in which it's okay. And I think like, if you go science fiction enough, you could probably come up with a case in which even the average person would think that like, it's all right. But like, it'd have to be a really crazy case having to do with like the evil person who's about to destroy the entire universe and you happen to see them at a distance and this is your one shot. But yeah, um, so yeah, those sorts of questions here and the ways, and I think one of the interesting things about ethics is the ways in which, and who was it who just, um, Sakshi brings up that like, it's been made political. But another thing to point out is that just about any question that gets made political generally starts, like part of the reason it gets so motivated is that it starts from an ethical standpoint. Like people don't argue about tax levels from a purely mathematical tax like question. It's not like people are like, what is the ideal tax structure for ease of IRS like policy? When people are arguing about taxes, what are they arguing about? What is the fundamental issue that they're having? Corn. Um, they're arguing about like how the money should be spent, like whether poor people should be given more food or like housing, or whether like the military should be given more weapons. It's really like there's a definite ideo ideological um, sort of basis for each one of the arguments. As a matter of fact, I, um, I, there's just like famous guy who actually um, said specifically how they wanted to change. Like, you can't just say, oh, you know, I hate, you know, people of color. You have to say like, I'm concerned about spending too much uh, on taxes um, to like really directly put matters of ethics um, into a more distant language so it's easier to um, you know discuss without yeah, and, seeming like a monster. And I think that's the key thing with like politics is ethics on a grand scale. So it's actually as you say it's been made political and in some sorts of ways like politics is just ethics because the question of like should we spend our money on the military is really the question of what should we value more national security defined loosely or providing necessary resources to people in low income situations? What is better? Is providing income to people, is that quote unquote making them lazy or is that going to provide people with opportunities? Is what sort of track tax structure is the fairest? Should we care about it? Should, should fairness be something that matters to us? These are all examples of ethical questions. And really, the, these are really grand scale ones, but you can also have them in like an everyday context. Something like, how many of you have had a situation in which, you know, you accidentally walked out of a store not realizing you were holding something that you hadn't paid for? Has anyone ever had this experience? No, but my brother-in-law did the other day. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, I definitely, like I am absent-minded as hell on certain occasions. And if you walk out for it, you now have an ethical question. Do you go back in and return it? Do you say like, 
I accidentally walked out with it. Do you just keep going? What do you do in this situation? In some sense, this is an ethical question. It's much smaller scale. And again, I agree with Don. It, it really depends on the case. Like, what is it? Did you just walk out with $1,000 in cash? You should probably tell somebody about it. Is it a Twix bar from a like CVS? Probably nobody cares. Yeah, um, that's exactly what I meant. Like, it depends on like the item. So I've gone to like, so I have this little cousin. When she was younger, um, she would always like, you know, kids, they just grab stuff from the store. She's probably like three years old or something at this point. So she'd grab like, you know, little things like pencils or like, you know, candy bars or whatever. It's like little things like that. If we made it all the way to the car, like it's like, okay, whatever. But then like if we go into the store and like hypothetically speaking, she was to like, you know, grab like a, a air purifier, hypothetically speaking. Okay, we got to bring that back. That's like $80. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's exactly the end. So the thing we're going to be talking about in this class. Um, <laughs> yeah. So Kosi says where he's from, if you pick up money that isn't yours, you'll turn into a yam. This is another really good one of just like, you know, what do you do if you pick up money? Um, do you just put it in your pocket? Do you leave it there? Do you pick it up and then ask people about it? Like, what do you do? These are all ethical questions. And so what we're going to be talking about in the next couple weeks, or I guess the next couple classes is basically, how do you even go about answering these questions? How do you go about answering, is it ever okay to steal? What sorts of things should you take into account and why are those good things to take into account? So for instance, why is it that the fact that the air purifier costs $80 makes any difference? Is it simply that the higher a number is like, you know, if I stole something that weighed 80 pounds then I'd have to return it, but something that weighed one pound, you don't have to, that doesn't seem right. So what is it about the money? Why does it matter? In another case, in a case in which, you know, um, let's see, what are some of the other ones we had here? In a, um, in the abortion debate, some people are willing to say, like even anti-abortion, like strong anti-abortion people, some of them are still willing to say in a case of rape or mother's medical emergency, you're an abortion is okay. Why are there these exceptions? What does it matter? Why are these the cases? How should we go about deciding which things matter? These are the questions that we're going to be talking about for this week, because in some sense, all of you can easily think of what a particular moral example is. And all of you have this general idea that it has to do with good, bad, right, wrong. If I told you a particular case, you'd be able to explain to me whether it was a moral issue or not a moral issue. However, the question is, Given that we all understand these things, how do we go about answering moral questions? How do we go about finding what the right thing to do is? Why should we approach it in this way as opposed to that way? Why is it that certain types of things, when you're trying to figure out what the right thing to do is, you just ignore them entirely and you don't worry about them? While other things like how much money, why is that relevant? These are all the things we'll be discussing here. So does that make sense about what we're going to be doing? So we're going to be taking these general sorts of, of questions, these general sorts of issues, having to do with good, bad, right, and wrong, and ask ourselves, how do you go about doing it? How should you study morality? But before we do that, let's just ask an even more general question, which is, why the hell should we waste our time doing this? Why not just say, oh, it's all just opinions and run away? What's the point of studying morality? And I think there's a couple answers here. I have a question. Could you say yeah. um, ethics is like subjective in a way? So here I think is a real issue here. And this is one of the questions of how should you do it? One of the things you have to ask yourself with morality is how do you do it? Well, this how do you do it leads into a lot of other more general questions. One question is, is it subjective? And what do we mean by subjective here? It's just up to you and what your moral code is. And it seems like in some ways we want to say that certain aspects of our actions might be subjective. But there's also ways in which we don't necessarily want to say it's subjective. So for instance, imagine that um, you come into class 
one day, like you come in in person and whoever the first person was who, or no, here's a better case. Imagine those of you who have come in, you know, there's that class that ends five minutes before us. That's always in the same room. Yes. So imagine that you come in one day and lying on the ground, bloody is the professor of that class. And you ask me, why is that professor lying in a pool of his own blood? And I say, I murdered him. And then you ask me, why did you do that? That's wrong. And my response is, I don't think murder is wrong. It's just subjective. You know, it's just my opinion. Murder is fine. What would your response to me in this case be? That what would you crazy. say? Say that again, Netta. That you're crazy. <laughs> you say I'm crazy. You'd call 911 and you'd say like, no, professor, you are just wrong. There's something deeply troubling about murdering someone who is just in your classroom for no good reason. It's not just subjective. It's the fact that you think it's fine doesn't make it fine. So there's something here about morality that's more than just like my opinion on it. Like, I think it's totally fine to oppress other people. Doesn't mean it's actually fine to oppress other people. I think it's fine to murder someone. Doesn't mean that it's fine. Or at least at a first glance, it doesn't. You might disagree with me once you start thinking about it more, but at a first glance, it sure as hell seems like there's something different about like, if I draw up a circle, if I draw up a, um, if I draw up a squiggle like this, and I ask you, Actually, no, that's, that one's too abstract. If I draw this and ask you what it looks like, and you say one thing and I say something else, and we disagree, and I say, well, this is just my opinion, then like it seems somehow different than, you know, I murder someone, it's just my opinion. Corin, did you have a question? Yeah, I did. Um, Because I, I wanted to know if you think that. That is true um, wholesale. So uh, I wanted to know if you think that's true wholesale or like where the line from opinion to um, like objective um, strays because I've heard uh, quite a few people like in good faith seemingly make uh, the, the like, I don't know, I guess point or argument that like uh, people can choose to be trans and that's their choice and I can choose to to not accept that or essentially be transphobic same with gays you know um, I don't really hear people saying like it's my choice to be racist but um, then on a, a similar level where the choice is like how where your choice is one option affecting other people like with the vaccine I see a lot of like anti-vaccine uh, people say like, you can choose to get the vaccine and I'm okay with that. I choose not to, and you need to respect my choice. Not in the sense of like, like obviously no one's gonna tie people down and force them to get the vaccine, but they mean accept my choice in like, don't criticize it. Um, Cause it's just a matter of opinion. Yeah, and I think this is a really good thing of like, there clearly seems to be some difference between subjective questions and like personal choices. Like for instance, if we go to the ice cream store and I order chocolate and you don't like chocolate, you can in some sense poke fun at me for getting chocolate ice cream and tell me, we had, uh, somebody in my last class said it tasted like chocolate ice cream tastes like charcoal with sugar in it. He's allowed to say that. He can say it to me. That's his thing. And if I then do this, there's something not moral about this sort of case. It seems like there's something different in the personal case. However, there's also, though, I think there is an unclear sort of situation, but because of like the line between personal choice and subjective cases, and then, um, uh, you know, on the other side, like objective, clear moral facts. And I think that we typically do think of this as a sort of case in which there's a clear divide between them. But I do think that there is something to be said here. And I'm just repeating what you said, Corin, and then I'm going to answer your question about like, there are cases in which it seems like it's not especially clear whether you can say it's personal choice 
or whether it's something moral. And I think that what this shows is that morality in some sense is somehow tied in with a more general situation about humanity as a whole. So for instance, you can imagine a case in which like, imagine you are a, uh, you're a soldier. You've been drafted, it's back in the days in which there was a draft and you could be selected to join the army completely at random. And now imagine the person who's been assigned to stand next to you in the army is a complete pacifist. They refuse to engage in violence under any circumstance whatsoever. So in some sense, in this case, it is their personal choice not to engage in violence. But on the other hand, it's not just their personal choice. Why not? Why isn't it in some sense just their personal choice? And in some sense, it becomes a more moral issue. Well, now imagine they're the person next to you when you're standing there with your gun reloading and an enemy soldier walks towards you. Now all of a sudden your pacifist person's pacifist decision is suddenly a collective decision. So I think one thing that morality has to do with, or one way in which morality is somewhat different than subjective, is very often moral questions have to do with like a bigger societal considerations. And so there is a debate to be had though. And I think one of the reasons why these sorts of things become so easy to argue about is the every personal decision has some implications for other people. And every general decision arises off of personal choices at an individual level. So where do you draw the line between this? And I think that there's not a clear cut case. So like, for instance, vaccine stuff, I think it really comes down to like your worries about public health and like, when people say it's not a personal choice opinion, it's a public health opinion. Basically what they're saying is the relationship between getting a vaccine is the same as the relationship, but it, getting a vaccine is akin to drunk driving. Like on one sense, you chose to drive, but you are still behind a wheel. In the same way, if you don't get vaccinated, then you are putting others at risk. So that's the idea. And I think you're right though. There's not a clear answer here. So one thing though that, when you're looking at morality and how to do it, one of the things you're looking at is, is it subjective slash personal choice or is it a public sort of question? Is it a universal sort of thing that applies to more people? And it seems like ethical questions are generally speaking, things that apply more universally. That got a little rambly and I apologize for that, but does that make sense to everyone? About just like what this idea, of, when we're talking about morality, it seems like it's about public something or the universal society. Got it. Do you have a question? No, I was going to say it makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've already started down the line of how do you do it? So what are some other ways then, or actually, no, I want to go back to why. Why should we w waste our time studying ethics and morality? Why do we bother discussing this stuff? You know, there are many questions we have in our lives that we don't bother discussing. So why are we talking about ethics? What's What's the point of having this class, I guess, is a general way of asking this. Or another question is, why do you ever ask a moral question? Or why do you ever, why would you ever study how to go about asking moral questions? Neta. Is it because like uh, to doubt and not accept it as like, you know? So um... I, think, I think this is one big reason. And honestly, the why you should study it, there's... In, there's no one right answer. There's tons of different right answers. And I think one thing is question conventional wisdom. That is not how you spell conventional or wisdom, but I don't care. So, but um, I think one thing you can ask is like, why should you study this? Well, because many of us learn or are told what's right and what's wrong when we're children. We are told by our parents what should be right and what should be wrong. And one of the major ways in which a society starts doing something that people in later generations look back on. And um, Gotti, was that you who had a hand? I can call on you as soon as I'm done this little thing. I just yeah, want no to expand on that point. So one of the major things that you can, like one of the major ways in which a society changes 
is when somebody looks back and sees like people of an earlier generation did it this way. And now that we're stopping and thinking about it, we realize that that wasn't a way that we should have done it. And the only way we got to this point, like, you know, for most of America's history, uh, is it most 1776? I guess, no, it's about half of America's history at this point. Uh, women were not allowed to vote. Uh, people of color were not allowed to vote, like for much of American history. We now look back on that and say like, that was pretty fucked. And now, well, why, how did we get to this point of, we now live in a society that we can look backwards and say that was pretty fucked. Well, we, somebody came along and questioned the conventional wisdom. So one of the reasons to talk about ethics is it seems like as a society, we want to improve or get better or at the very least, there are things about our society we think aren't good or bad. Or we do things without thinking. And one thing ethics can do is help us question those things and come to different decisions and live in ways that we would be happier with. All right, got it. What were you? Oh, I was just going to say on the why study it thing, uh, I guess the same answer about questioning conventional wisdom of, uh, but I was going to say, I guess it's looking at it as like applying critical thinking to why we think a certain way. So yeah, I mean, one thing, one practical reason simply why I talk about ethics is ethics is one of the best areas to apply critical thinking skills. Because at the end of the day, ethics is one of these areas in which it's something a lot of us care about in our everyday lives. And yet the just about the only way you can actually answer moral questions is by thinking about them. So for instance, um, you're cooking a turkey. You are cooking this turkey. And what's a question you have to ask yourself whenever you're cooking a turkey or any sort of meat or anything? Is this fully cooked? Yeah. Is it fully cooked? Or another way of, is it hot enough inside this thing? Is it fully cooked? How do you test? Is it cooked? How do you figure out if you've got a turkey? That's a turkey. You want to find out if it's cooked or not. What do you do? You cut the meat. You either cut the meat or you stick a thermometer in it or something like that. So let's just imagine you stick a thermometer in. It says 165 and YouTube says that's high enough. So now you're good to go. But contrast this with a case. You know, you're trying to decide is the death penalty ever justified? How many of you think the right way to do this is stick a thermometer into the death penalty and see if it's a high enough temperature? Like. There's no such thing as a morallometer. It doesn't exist. We have thermometers. We don't have morallometers. They don't work. So how instead do you have to do it? Well, you have to study what makes something right or wrong, why we think something's right or wrong, analyze the different components of it. So that's another reason we study it, is that it's a way of applying our critical thinking skills and specifically, it's a way of applying our critical thinking skills to a topic that really can't be studied in any other way. You can't go out there and test it. So does that make sense? Yeah. Here's another reason I think that's worth talking about. So question conventional wisdom. You have to it, basically practice critical thinking. So one thing is basically, um, One thing it does is it helps us practice our critical thinking skills. So from a practical way, it's very useful. Another way though, is basically, um, or another thing to, damn mosquitoes are back. Uh, another thing to say on this point though, is it's not just that allows you to practice critical thinking. How many of you have been in a situation in which you clearly thought there had to be a right moral thing to do here, but you sure as hell didn't know what it was? I mean, I've definitely been there. If nobody else has been in this situation, then we've got a lot of very... Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. The question is, how many times have you been in a situation in which you thought there was probably a right thing to do and you wanted to do the right thing, but you had no idea what the right thing in that situation was? A lot of times, yes. 
There's a lot of time, I guess. Yeah, I mean, and that's the thing is our everyday lives are full of these little moral issues. And how can you figure out what the right thing to do is in a new situation? Well, you've thought about other similar situations in the past because every single one of us in our everyday lives runs into moral issues. It can be things in the workplace. It can be things in our personal lives. It can be... Um, things in our school lives. These are sorts of questions in which if you've thought about them and analyzed and come up with your own, like you're confident in your own ideas of what's right, what's wrong, what makes something right, what makes something wrong, you'll be better prepared in your everyday life to solve these sorts of issues. So it's not just about questioning conventional wisdom, although that's definitely a part of it. Another issue is uh, it gives you a way to practice, or another reason is it allows you to practice critical thinking. Another one is um, practice for real life. It allows you to practice real life sorts of things. And then another, um, another thing it allows you to do or another reason to study ethics is just, it's something which human beings seem drawn to. It seems like it's the sort of thing that we as people cannot help but find interesting in some way. For instance, like, let's just be honest here. There's already more of you talking today and engaging and asking questions than there are when I'm discussing validity or anything like that. There's a reason that the abortion debate leads to people standing on street corners, waving signs. There's a reason that the death penalty debate gets newspaper articles written about it. There's a reason that people uh, write musicals on the premise, is it okay to steal bread to save your family? There are reasons for this. It's that human beings find this stuff just fundamentally fascinating. And there are very few people who do not in any way care about morality. It seems like every one of us in our everyday lives cares about it to some degree. So if it's something you care about, you have some reason to want to understand it better. Or at the very least, if you find it fascinating, just the act of doing it is something that's going to be worthwhile and enjoyable for you. So I think that's the, the fourth thing. Of There are a few things, I think, in school that you can generally say, Every human being has some base level interest in this thing. And I think morality is one of those few things. Um, so I just think like, it's interesting on some level. You have to do a lot of ethics and have it be your job for a long time before you begin to find it boring. And so, and another reason I think that ethics is worth doing is this interesting thing often leads you down a path into other bigger interesting questions. So Cosi just said, he had a quote from Shakespeare, there is no good or bad, only the thinking that makes itself. There's a way in which when you start to think about morality and what's good and bad, right and wrong, you start to find yourself questioning things that are just fundamental about our lives. So for instance, in your everyday life, you tend to think there's an obvious good and obvious bad. But once you start asking what makes something good or bad, you start to go down a path in which it becomes difficult to say what's good or bad. And it will lead you to a lot of more interesting questions. Things like, all right, if morality seems different from a subjective personal choice, how is it different? Why is me ordering chocolate ice cream and you ordering vanilla ice cream? To take Horn's example, how is that different from a case in which one person says, I, it's my preference to respect trans people versus another person who says it's my choice to discriminate against them. How is that case different from the chocolate ice cream, vanilla ice cream case? Because all of us, I think, have some gut feeling that there's something different here. But once you start analyzing it, it can be really interesting of just analyzing what makes it different. Um, so that's the whole why should we study it thing. And hopefully you're all on board. And at the very least, we'll be discussing some things that you all find interesting over the next few weeks, because I think there's a lot of them. And the reason I'm focusing on, basically, I find the, the reason I've chosen the ethical questions that I will be talking about this semester is I just find 
the overlap of ethics and modern technology a truly fascinating topic in and it's the sort of thing that every one of us like you know i'd be willing to bet every one of you has had at some point a social media account of some sort so the ethical questions that are tied in in these ways i think are something that is relevant to every one of our lives so i think that so that's why we're going to be talking about a lot of the topics that we will be talking about but that's generally speaking what why we're doing it here and hopefully you all find something that we talk about over the next few weeks interesting or at the very least more interesting than what is inductive validity um any more questions on the why study or any more thoughts on why it's worth studying all right so i'm gonna erase everything and we're gonna get on to number four this how do you go about asking moral questions or another way of putting this is when you ask what is right and what is wrong what are you asking what is it you're looking for for your answer what sorts of answers are appropriate to this question and so that's what i want to talk about for the end of class both what is it you are doing and what is it you aren't doing when you ask this question Corin. Um, I had a, a question or like, yeah, about the, the, the thing you said before this. Um, so in, in general, like when we look at um, our, our societies, uh, things tend to go from like more conservative and strict to more like different people being accepted until like the society collapses and a new society is created. So like, especially in the US, like, you know, the founding fathers, we're like, okay, even if you go back to Britain, it's like, okay, they had a king for a long time and you know they had religious persecution. So people are like, we're gonna create a new country that doesn't have religious persecution, but it has slavery. And then like, as time progressed, they're like, oh, maybe we should let, you know, black people, Native Americans, women, gays, you know, just, just everyone kind of, most people have rights. Um, and even going back to like how gay marriage was literally just legalized in 2015, like what, but you know, whatever. Um, so yeah, the question is, I can see, and not just this society, but like probably other societies, um, a trend towards um, like literally progress that um, is always in, a struggle with conservatism, like keeping it um, the same, but is there an end goal or like, will, will there ever be like, is there ever even a chance to have morals like right or like find a consensus of morality that doesn't change? So here's what I'm going to say to that, which is uh, if you've got an answer to that question, you uh, have reached the goal of most ethical theorists in human history. And so the thing is that like, what I would say on this is there's no clear answer. And this is another reason that ethics is worth doing is despite the fact that there, it's very easy to point to many wrong answers, finding the right answer is really difficult. And I think there's something about understanding why the wrong answers are wrong to understand why in the process of doing that, you can begin to ask yourself, is there a right, right answer at the end? Are we ever going to get to the pinnacle of like perfect society? Or is there always going to be some issue here? And I think the fact is that like, you can look at a society and see it's a complicated mess. And in a lot of ways, we see progress on these sorts of fronts. But in other ways, progress, you know, we make forward progress and then we go backwards a little bit and then we go sideways. And I think that it's tough to really say will we ever get to the right morality without first understanding what is this thing? So I think in some sense, the question you asked of, can we ever get to the one objective moral truth? That's gonna be tied in with the question of like, to before we can answer that question, we have to ask ourselves, well, what is this thing morality? Because somebody who like, and to go with Andre's point before of, is morality just subjective? There have been people who genuinely believe that morality is a lie and all there is is personal preference. And the way they get to this point is through a lot of thinking. And so to that person, they would just say, progress is an illusion, we'll never get the perfect society. But if you're somebody who's unsatisfied with that, 
and you want to understand why you're unsatisfied with it, that's another reason to do the ethics is basically you have to, there are going to be people who think it's all just opinions. What can you say to them to convince them otherwise? And I, and I also agree of, yeah, it seems like human beings in reality, perfection will never be possible. But another question you might ask is even something like, even practically speaking, it's not just that perfection isn't possible because we live in an imperfect world, but rather the very idea of there being a perfect moral system is fundamentally flawed because morality is something that isn't of that sort. So something we'll be talking about next week is, is this idea that maybe morality is relative to what culture you're in and what counts as acceptable in one culture is acceptable in that culture. And in a different culture, it's genuinely different. And there are many issues with this view. There are many positive things about this view. And so we'll be talking about that next week. But I think this is really the thing of just like, to answer these big picture questions of like, is it worth fighting for justice? And for somebody who believes that it is, ask yourself, what is it about justice that is worth fighting for? And I think that there are good answers to be given, but somebody's going to come along and ask you, what's the point of fighting for equality? Human beings are completely, you know, we're all born different and, you know, the strong survive and yada, yada, yada. And if you want to be able to respond to this person and say, that's crap, you have to think about why it's crap first. So, um, yeah. All right. So then how do you go about doing ethics or at the very least when you're doing ethics, what does it seem like you're doing to, what does it seem that you're doing? What does it seem that you're talking about? So first off, we said that morality has to do with right and wrong, or if I could spell wrong, but it seems first off how and how not. So the first thing I want to do is just talk about one thing that it doesn't seem like we're doing. And really the idea is just to get a better understanding of what doing ethics is by looking at some things it's not. It's basically a, you understand something better when you know what it's not. So one thing it seems like morality isn't is a different type of right and wrong. So how many, and this, this is also a test of, are you awake right now? How many of you have ever had a question in a class that you've wanted to ask the professor or you've had an answer to a question that you wanted to give to the professor? All right. Now, come on, testing, testing. Those of you, many of you have actually asked me questions but are not raising your hands now. All right. Those of you who asked this question, how many of you signaled your, your wanting to answer this, ask this question by raising your foot in the air? You got, you turned your body sideways in your chair and you raised your foot as high as you could in the classroom. How many of you did this? Anybody? Simple question, why not? Why didn't you raise your foot? Because it's awkward, it's weird. It's, 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 it's weird. weird. In some sense, it's the wrong thing to do. But when you think about it, it's not wrong in the same sense in which like I go into the classroom and murder a teacher, a fellow teacher is wrong. Like if I murder someone, that wrong is in some sense a lot worse than the person who's lifting their foot up. Like your response would be like, this is an attention seeking person. They're a little weird, but you know, they're not a bad person. They're just a little eccentric. By contrast, the person who comes into the classroom and murders someone else, they're wrong in a different sense. So the first thing to point out with morality is that it doesn't just seem like what you're talking about are the norms of a society. There's some relation between them. So for instance, there's some moral aspect. Do people know what I mean by norms, first off? What is a norm? I may have mentioned this in a few other classes um, or at least one other class. Have people seen this word norm before? Yes. And do, does anyone think they could give a definition? It's a really hard term to define. Well, I always thought like, you know, um, norm being something that's normal, like it's derivative from the word normal. So it's like, you know, just something that's kind of like agreed upon in society. Yeah. So it's, it's entirely agreed upon. It's something that's agreed upon in society and is the normal thing to do, but it's usually a little stronger. So for instance, it's not just that it's something we happen to do. It's rather that it's something everyone in society, it's like an unwritten rule that everyone in society follows. 
without it really, like there are certain things we all do, but aren't really norms. Like for instance, we all chew our food. That's not a norm. We all do it. It's normal to chew your food before you swallow, but it's not a norm. A norm is this unwritten rule that things could be different, but we happen to do it in this way. So for instance, um, in the United States, we typically pick up food with a fork. That is a norm. We could do it with chopsticks. We could do it with our hands. Those would work just as well, if not better in certain cases. But our norm is to you know, do it with a fork. Other norms include things like, um, there are a lot of norms around like elevator behavior. So what are some of the norms around elevators? And you all follow these rules. They're unwritten and yet every one of us knows to follow them. So what are some things that you're supposed to do in an elevator? And what are some things you're not supposed to do in an elevator? And no one's ever written this down to you, but you know what you are and aren't supposed to do. Like if you see someone coming, you have to like put your hands so the thing doesn't close. Yeah, that's one. That's one of just like, if you just like pull your hand back when somebody's not coming, you've kind of violated a norm. And actually, I think this one might have a kind of moral dimension because the person who doesn't hold the door for you is just, you know, kind of a dick. <laughs> um, like to put it simply, but there are other sorts of ones where it's not really a wrong thing and there's less of a moral dimension. Has anyone, and the way you can really know that a norm has been broken or that there's a norm is you recognize it when it's been broken. So for instance, has anyone ever gotten on an elevator and just stood facing everybody? You just look everyone in the eyes. Like you have, <laughs> it's, I mean, we all laugh because we know somehow that's the wrong thing to do. It's not causing any harm. It's just everyone gets really uncomfortable. Another really fun one, if you ever, we can't do it during the, the um, pandemic because of social distancing, but before the pandemic, if you ever wanted to really be weird without actually causing any harm, is there's escalator behavior, which is basically like, don't share a step with a stranger. So if you ever want to do something completely weird, just you join a stranger on their step. And then when they take a step up feeling uncomfortable, you join them on their next step. That's another thing where this is a norm. It's like, there's nothing really wrong about this. It's just weird. I so, think another norm that it's kind of, it's more so what guys typically do in the bathroom. So like, you know, the urinals, how it's yes. like, like every other one. And then when there's that one guy that stands next to you, it's like, okay, you're being weird. Yeah. <laughs> Your male behavior in bathrooms is one of the great norm governed behaviors. And um, like, there's also strong ladies who have never used a urinal. There's a strong rule about you look dead ahead. You can look up, you can look down, but you never look side to side. Like that is just unacceptable. These are the things you're just not supposed to do around. And it's not like anyone ever taught you this. You just somehow know that that's what you do at a urinal. Um, you're supposed to stand far, like these are the things that like that is no, urinal behavior. Um, so these are what we're talking about with norms, but these somehow seem different from moral things. Like to give a case, it seems like Kosi's point of a peeping Tom is somehow different. Like somebody who drills a hole in the woman's locker room to stare through it at naked women, something is very different in this case. So that notion of right and wrong is different from a norm. So the first thing to point out of when you're asking an ethical question, you're not, it seems like you're not simply asking descriptively, what does this society happen to do? It's not just like this society happens to wear shoes with uh, buckles, or this society happens to wear shoes where you tie them, or this society happens to walk on the right side. This society happens to walk on the left. It's rather that ethics is saying something more. It's that there's some more fundamental way in which the rightness is right and the wrongness is wrong. It's not just descriptively a characterization of how we actually do something and therefore how we should continue to do it to keep things running smoothly. It's more like this is the right thing to do in a deeper, oomphier sense. So does that make sense to people that this notion of ethics, the ethical right and ethical wrong, whatever it is, it's got this oomphy sort of feeling to it. So then we know it's not right and wrong. Another thing we said before is it's not, you don't just ask yourself like your own opinions on it. Murder 
murder is not always wrong isn't or doesn't equal I'm cool with murder. You might not be what else. Again, there seems something different about morality between these personal opinions. So it seems like at the very least, if you want to account for morality, you have to explain why they feel so different in opinion case versus this. You might, as I said before, you might be someone with these very extreme views that morality is not real, it's all an illusion. And in that case, you have to explain then, well, if that's the case, why does it feel so different? So then, how do you go about solving moral questions? Or what are some other ways in which morality is different from other sorts of issues? Well, I honestly think the best way to figure out how you go about doing morality or what sorts of considerations is just to take a moral issue and explain our views on it. And ex like try to figure out or explain why you think something's right or wrong and what sorts of things you take into consideration. So does anyone have a moral issue? I don't want anything that's gonna uh, cause like huge divides. And you know what, I'm gonna use the same one I used last class because it worked pretty well. And plus this way I get to pretend I'm cool and hip and up with pop culture. Um, here's the question I want us to answer. Is the Squid game. Okay. So, how many of you have watched it? I have not, but I know enough about it. Squid game on Netflix. Anyone? Does everyone know the general premise behind it? Yeah. Uh, all right. I'm going to explain it to those who don't in a slightly modified version. The basic idea is you've got a bunch of very broke people who agree to play. Uh, and I'm gonna, I haven't seen it either, Lauren, but the basic idea, yeah. Broke people agree to play this game. This game, they quickly learn if you lose the game, you get killed and there's only one winner. The winner's the one person who survives to the end. That's generally what I understand the plot to be. Now I'm gonna change it a little bit for this question of imagine if going into it. What's imagine if, than that? It's a little different what? than that. It's a little different than that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going with a simplified version. No, what I was going to say is like, yeah, they're broke, but it's kind of like people that have like racked up like debt. Oh, yeah. Why they broke. So like, for example, the main character, he's like racked up debt to the point where like he's like taking his mom's funds from her accounts. Okay. He's so really yeah, sorry. So it's not just broke. It's like very, very negatively broke and have a ton of debt. I mean, that's not really a spoiler. Yeah, that's like that. in the preview. <laughs> I just forgot to mention it. Um, um, I would like to add, um, there are some cases where uh, characters like could there could be a moral aspect of like oh this guy's actually a gambler it's that's first episode stuff but there are some people who um are like immigrants and not being paid their their uh, money that they're uh that they work for and uh people like someone who escaped north korea so it's a variety of okay so let's go let's just go with let's imagine a case in which like these are all cases in which people are deeply deeply in debt now imagine if going into the game they knew what they were signing up for was this thing where if you lose, you die. So I know that's not actually the plot, but imagine it were actually the plot where people who signed up knew they were signing up for the squid game where you get killed if you lose. So here's our question then. Is that game okay? Is it okay to have a game in which incredibly in debt people who can't make money in any other way agree to play a game of survival of the fittest, where if they lose, they die. And it's their choice to play. Is that okay? Kosi, did you have a question or comment? Okay. Oh, no, I was just raising my hand from- Oh, no worries. So, all right, so here's the question. Is it a yes, no question? Now then, what's the follow-up though? And here's the big follow-up, why? Why do you say it's okay, or why do you say it's not okay? So, Lauren, that's a hand. See, I don't think it's a definite yes, because I understand being in a position where you cannot make money, and it's, you know, this is a surefire way of making money, but I think it the 
ethical dilemma is who is deciding the game who is deciding the rules who is regulating this because if they just like end up killing everyone in general or they're not fair then like how can that be monitored and also making sure that that power doesn't go to their heads because like power really does like change um everything so i think i i I wouldn't want to say yes or no without understanding who is in charge of this so and this is exactly one thing that i want to highlight is one of the things that you do when you're doing ethics is you start asking and you start dissecting things you don't just come up immediately with a simple yes no answer because things are complicated so one thing you have to take into account is who is the one supplying the money? Who's in charge of the game? Does the fact that they're able to call, like, make this game happen, does that matter? Dondra? Um, I, uh, I think it's, the reason I say yes is because the part where, like you said, essentially, like, you've disclosed that, you know, we're playing a game for money, you know, you're broke, whatever. Um, so kind of like, I'm giving you that choice, essentially. It's your choice to sign up. It's your choice not to sign up. That's entirely up to you. Um, so that's kind of like why I go with yes, because it's kind of playing on the, you know, um, everybody has like free will, if you kind of, um, if that kind of makes sense. So like, for example, it's your choice to get up to go to school in the morning or not to go to school in the morning. Um, everybody has that choice. Nobody's forcing you to do it. Um, so that's kind of why I think it's okay. And I think that's a really good thing to bring up is it does seem, like to me at least, the Squid Game would seem way worse if you were like like Hunger Games style, you just round up children and make them fight to the death with no choice. Like that seems way worse than a case in which you give someone a choice. Like, or at least um, at the very least, that's one of my gut senses. I'm not certain everyone agrees with me on this one, but that's kind of like my gut feeling of like maybe this, so maybe the choice matters to some degree. Corn, did you have a hand? Oh, um, yeah, in a larger sense, but also about the Hunger Games. Uh, I don't know if you read it or like watched it recently, but like the main one of the main like pretty much the inciting incident is the character who's poor and starving literally volunteers to be in the Hunger Games in place of her sister. And um, in the this is like snare trivia, but in uh, there are actually people who are professional like children who have been trained all their lives to be really good at the games. So that's um, some, that, yeah. that adds some interesting texture to the discussion. Yeah, and that's the thing. And this is why like anytime you describe something very simply, you end up glossing over what end up, and this is one of the things with ethics, which is worth talking about of like, when you're doing ethics, the little details start to matter. Things like, does she volunteer or is she forced to join the Hunger Games? Versus, does this person volunteer? Gotti, what were you going to say? Uh, I was going to ask, uh, just to clarify, so they're like signing up to play this game knowing the consequences. Yes. Imagine that's the case. I don't know if that's, I, I'm pretty sure it's not exactly like that in the show, but that's my version of it to ask in this ethics class okay. of, yeah, imagine that they sign up knowing. Or uh, another question is like, if, if they sign up knowing and offering them this choice, they have the choice to say no. Is it even okay to give them the option of saying yes? Like, I guess that's one way of putting it. Um, Lauren, is that your hand from before or is that a... Uh... Oh, sorry, I forgot to put it. No out. worries. Um, let's go Kosi, then Dondre, then Corin again. My thing is, uh, I think Squid Game was okay because, I mean, they were already broke. And so then this, so then they now use the incentive of money to like kind of lure them in. So it's like their greed is essentially, you know, being the reason for their misfortune. So I think at the same time, since it's consensual, it's like, I think it's okay. It's not yeah. as if it's like so, you know, like when he just like wants to play a game and like kills people, like stuff like that. And I think, and here's the thing is like, I think to some degree, there's something about consent which matters in our views. like. And you might disagree to some sense of like, does this consent, is this consent enough to make the squid game okay? But I do think that like, and I think there is also an element that comes in of like, why are these people broke? And I think there's the sort of thing where like, if you, and this is why ethical questions get so complicated, is if it's the sort of thing where like this person was just a complete jerk and like didn't like 
grew up wealthy and blew it all on hookers and cocaine. Like we're gonna have very different views than like Corin said of the person who flees from North Korea. And I think that like why somebody is broke or in extreme debt plays a role in these sorts of issues. Um, Dandre, you have a hand again. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, so with, like, this show, for example, like, they didn't know in the beginning that, yeah. you know, they were doing that. But um, the way the, the way it works, essentially, is like, if while the game starts, if you don't want to play anymore, it comes to, like, a vote. And if the majority say they don't want to play, then the game stops. Um, but then you see in the show that um, even though the game stopped, the people did that, that quit the game, they still chose to go back and play it again to finish the game. So I think that's why the point I'm getting at, essentially, is, I do believe consent essentially gives it the, you know, the okay. Cause even when they, even after the fact that they knew what, what the games were like, they still chose to go back and play it further. And I think this is a big thing, but here's, and this is when the doing of ethics really comes in and where the critical thinking comes in is why should we care about consent? What is it? Because I share this gut feeling that in some way getting consent matters, but let's actually unpack and think. Think for a second, what is it about consent that makes it so important? Like at the end of the day, getting killed is getting killed. Getting skinned alive is getting skinned alive. I know I don't think that happens in the show, but I like to go to extremes. So what is it about, or to go with an actual example that happened, this must be a couple decades old at this point. Um, there was a man in Germany who was arrested for killing and eating his best friend. And the story was the best friend gave him permission and was like, look, I love you, man. I want us to like be together. I want you to like imbue my powers. So please eat me. And there was this issue here of like, does the fact that this person gave, like, if I gave you all permission to eat me, does that mean it's suddenly okay now? What is it about consent that really matters? Um, and I think, like, I, I don't think we're going to have an answer to it this class. It's rather going to be something we're talking about a bit more next class. We'll look at one person's explanation for why consent and things like that matter. But I think that this is something that's worth highlighting in this context is we all have these kind of base level, and this is going back to questioning our assumptions. Like, I agree in a fundamental way that getting consent in any sort of situation is very important. And especially like there's something that's better about killing someone who wants to be killed than killing someone who doesn't. But there's something also going on here where it's like, why should I feel that way? Like murder, is, killing is still killing. End of life is still end of life. Why does the fact that a person told me so that it's okay for me to chop off their arm and then eat the rest of them? What is it about that? that I'm explaining? Or should I just conclude that like when I start thinking about it, like maybe the correct conclusion to draw is my initial feeling was wrong, consent doesn't matter, death is death, we need to change our minds. Um, so does everyone generally understand like what it is we're doing right now is ethics. This is the study of morality. It's generally how you do this is you start off with, oh, corner, is that a question? Oh, no. Just okay, Andre, did you have a question? I don't want to cut either of you off. You both have your little. No, I forgot to put the hand on. Oh, okay. Yeah, no worries. I just didn't want to cut anyone off. So yeah, this is basically what doing ethics is: is it's taking particular sorts of questions, analyzing why you feel this way, so you can then take it and apply it in a new situation. And so, what we're really going to be talking about more next time is a classic sort of case to try to unpack some of our own views of what makes something right and what makes something wrong. And what we're gonna really look at is two main theories as to what's right and what's wrong that have existed in society. And we're gonna bring them out by looking at the classic trolley problem case. If you're familiar with it, you know it and might be bored of it, but too bad. Um, so what we're really gonna do next time is start looking at basically how do you do this? Well, you look at a, a case that seems simple, then you come up with the conclusion to that, and then you try and see if you can apply the same conclusion in new situations. And once we start unpacking and seeing what sorts of things work, what sorts of things don't work, we're then gonna to turn to more general sorts of ethical questions. We're gonna look at a more general thing of like, 
Should we accept that there's one universal principle that makes something right or something wrong? Or should we rather think it's relative to our culture? And then we're gonna look at like things like privacy in the modern age. Why do we like privacy? Should I care about all the data that's collected on me or should I not? Uh, has the nature of the internet changed hate speech and the ways we feel about it? Why or why not? Do we need different laws? Do we need different principles? Um, so that's what we'll be doing is basically this was our first example of how to do ethics. Next time we'll be learning a bit more about some of the particular theories people have used. The time after that, then we're just going to jump into more particular ethical qu questions that aren't related to the squid game. Um, any final questions on anything we talked about today? Comments, concerns, feelings. We all good? So, oh, Corin. Sorry, I didn't see your little hand up there. No worries. Um, uh, okay, three questions. Um, not really question questions, but like targeted questions, like guest discussion questions. One, um, does choice, like the consent from Squid Games, like they were literally so poverty stricken that it was in some cases quite literally play the squid game or die like we could relate that to real like if you made homeless people like bum fights so, like if you made them fight each other for a 50 dollar bill and they're like oh yeah i'll do it i'll, I'll kill like that, that's like a uh, there's not a lot of choice there like extreme poverty like if you don't have the the very basic needs met there's not okay sorry different thing um, second thing, we were just talking about how like murder is bad is like a universal sort of thing. Like most people will automatically say that, but I, I find it very concerning because in the squid games, there's, well, I don't know if it's actually been stated, but if you've seen it, there's a lot of like outright murder, even like, it, like direct murder, not like being like leaving someone in a dangerous situation. Like, so is that okay to make poor people murder them? Like literally just back to the bum fight thing. Third thing might be a tad politically charged, but I, I'm struck by the similarities of like making people, you know, play a game of chance and like a physical meritocracy wherein um, they're, they're compensated monetarily and their life is at risk strikes me as, as extremely similar to the way the US Army recruits in poor neighborhoods. So it's like they even like offer cars and most importantly, college tuition um, compensation. And it's like a lot of these people don't really have any other options or like the necessary skills to support themselves in other ways. Yet they're going into a situation where it is not unlikely that they will actually lose their life and they have to play in essence, a game of chance. So I know another person brought up like, I would hesitate to make a decision unless I understood the structure and who was in charge and who benefited from these things. But yeah, those are my three questions. Like the myth of consent when poverty, like, and um, is murder okay? Like you said, if someone says like, for right, kill me on my forehead, is that cool? And also like, even if someone's suicidal, which sorry, trigger warning, um, if someone's like, yeah, I like that uh, that weekend song, like take my breath away. Like, is it okay to listen to what someone says in that kind of mental state? But I guess that's something that's discussed in like a lot of euthanasia discussions. So uh, yeah, anyway. Yeah, so here's what I'm gonna say to everybody. If you need to get going, it's 845, feel free to go. I'm gonna answer all of Corin's questions. And if you're interested, stick around and we can keep talking. We've got, I've got nothing else going on tonight. So I'm happy to stick around and say like my views on these things. Um, and I think the first, so if you got to go, you're free to go. If you want to stick around, stick around. Um, I'll leave the recording running because this is going to be, I think, a really interesting discussion. And I think, so the first thing you raise of where's the line between choice and not choice is I think itself a major issue. And so basically what we've done with just to like diagram how we started here, we started with this question of, squid game okay and then we came to this maybe with choice and then we kind of jump off right now off of this is what counts as the correct level of choice because i agree that you know in some sense if you hold a gun to someone's head they have a choice to get shot in the head 
But on the other hand, is that really saying they have choice? Do they really have free will in this case? If you, if your child gets kidnapped and somebody says either, you know, your government employee, let's, let's go with like a stereotypical like plot from a like TV show or Bond movie or bad action movie, your child gets kidnapped and you work for the US government and they say you have to give these files away or else we're gonna kill your child. And you're not Liam Neeson who can solve all the world's problems with you know killing small Balkan cities entirely by yourself. Um, do you really have a choice not to do this? Well, it seems in this sort of case like it's really hard to define what counts as a choice and who gets to have a choice. Because in a certain sense, yeah, if you are in such extreme poverty that you will basically need any money you want, then does it count as a choice to use Corn's example of making homeless people fight for money? Like, did this person have a choice? But on the flip side, I think there's an argument of like, if this in what, like, on the one hand, this person is so desperate for money that they are willing to do this, and it doesn't seem like a choice. But on the flip side, it's like a, if this person genuinely in that situation wants the money, is it wrong to for them to choose to do it? Is the responsibility now, because it seems like the mistake is made at the offering point, not at the taking point. And how does that fit into this sort of thing? And then there's another issue of like, if you are in extreme poverty, might it be the case that even if you are in such an extreme poverty case, there is some sense in which it is still your choice to join the army or not. And I don't, and I honestly, I think there's good arguments on both sides. And there's also something of like a, you know, I, I think there's manipulative elements in terms of bribing people to do things. But there's also, I think, a sense in which like, just because somebody's offered money for something doesn't necessarily mean they didn't in some level get to choose. So I feel like that's not true. Some of them had debt because they were poor. The teenage girl's mother brought... Um, oh, okay. Amanda's commenting on uh, Kosi's last comment. So yeah, I think that's one thing. Now, another thing I want to say is I want to jump on your third point, Corinne, which is and, um, this idea of Another thing with ethics that often comes up is you often, one way in which you can analyze things is you can ask yourself, well, do I think this thing is okay? And then ask yourself, well, if I think this thing is okay, then I should think that other things that are similar to that, or actually, let me go with this one. I think the squid game is wrong. I think the US Army is okay. A question you might ask yourself at this point though is, I think the squid game is wrong because it's taking desperate people who are putting their lives at risk in exchange for monetary reasons. But I think the US Army is okay. And yet in some cases, somebody joins the army because they are joining it for financial reasons or are in extreme poverty. So in this case, I seem to be saying one thing is wrong, while well, another thing that looks very similar is right or okay. And a question you can ask yourself at this point is, what do I do in this case? Is it okay for me to say, yes, I agree with this one thing, but no, I disagree with this other thing, even though they're the exact same? In some sense, there seems something wrong. Like if I were to, I don't seem able to disagree with myself on certain moral things. I can't go, yeah, it's okay to kill your mother, but it's not okay to kill your mother. Like that's contradicting myself. Something's gone wrong. So in this case, do we say that if I'm okay with the, if I'm not okay with the squid game, does that mean I should say the army is wrong as well? Or should I say that, you know what, if the army's okay, the squid game must be okay as well. Or do I say, in fact, even if on the surface level, these two seem similar, maybe there's something different about them. Maybe I have to show and I have to analyze that in truth, the army case is different from the squid game case. But if so, then I need to explain why it is. So this is what doing ethics is. It's these taking these questions, you're gonna always ask more questions on these sorts of things. And one of the reasons that I think people get a bit, um, why ethics can be so difficult um, 
and and here comes again. Uh, should poor people be allowed to steal? I think this is another sort of one where it comes in with like the and I think different people are going to give different answers to this question. Yeah, exactly. The plot of blame is. Um, and uh, I think what what I wanted to demonstrate, what you all did a really nice job of today, is just the way in which even if we don't quite necessarily get to an end answer of because I don't feel like having talked about this, I feel any clearer on whether the squid game is okay or not. I see both sides, but through the act of seeing both sides, I feel like I understand the situation more and understand the sorts of considerations which are worth talking about and highlighting when considering other issues. So if my reason for thinking that the squid game is wrong is that I don't believe that these people really had a choice because of economic pressures and things like that, then I need to take these same considerations and I can now reapply them in different parts of my life. And I can ask myself then, how should I feel in an army case? How should I feel in these other sorts of cases? And so all of these things I think are worth highlighting and discussing. And I think what's worth discussing in all of these cases is just like the, and I think another thing to highlight here is the way in which having to separate, does something make me upset versus is it right or wrong? So I agree with Kosi here um, that if somebody stole my iPhone, I would be pretty mad about it. But just because I'd be mad about it, I don't necessarily know if that means that the person was wrong to do so if they were in desperation. And I think this is the other tough thing about ethics is I think there's just so many different things to take into account on any given case. Um, Corey. Um, I know we, we touched on it briefly earlier about um, the relativism, but do you think like people's experiences um, could inform like their, oh, I mean, they obviously do inform their opinions to some degree, but does that mean that if certain, if they're exposed to certain experiences, then their morality would change? And to be more specific, it's like, I um, grew up like super poor. Um, my, my PS3 uh, got like, someone broke into my house and stole it when I was like 10 or whatever. Um, but quite literally it was like, well, you know, if it's someone in this neighborhood, they probably needed that money for food or insulin or rent to not be homeless or, you know, something like that. So, I, yeah, perspective. That, that's my so I think there's a few different things to say here, and then I'll call on you, Dondre, is um, the things here are, there's a question of what morality rules are in a person's head. And there's no doubt that what happens in a person's life can affect what we store in our head and what we think is right or wrong. And so I think in a big way, like that is definitely true. But I think the question of whether or not, imagine that there's like up here written in the sky, the right thing. Does the, the everyday things that happen in our society, does that in some way affect what the counts as the right thing. And I think that that is an open question. I think it's a limited, I think it's going to be a case by case sort of thing. Um, thievery is, yeah, another good one. Dandre. Um, I just have a question about like the homework six. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I haven't even started yet because I've been wanted, to, I was going to class to ask you because it literally like makes no sense to me. Okay. Um, if you could just like explain that if you don't mind. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. A few people are a little confused by it. All right, here's basically the thing. We gave you five social, or we, I'm using the royal we, I shouldn't because I'm not royal. Um, I gave five different principles of social psychology. They were in-group preference, out-group dislike, uh, the conformity effect, the halo effect, or I guess conformity is just the principle, the halo effect, um, a, 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 let's see if I can remember the last two, um, authority, uh, uh, blah, blah, blah. what is the, something, can, blah, 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 blah. basically authorities tell you what to do and you listen to them. I can't remember, my brain is fried, but that one. Uh, and then the last one, was, we've got conformity in group, social proof. Social proof is the idea that the more people who see a thing, uh, or the more people who think a thing, the more likely you are to think that thing too. 
what I'm asking, the all of these principles are things that all advertisers know about. Advertisers know that we are more likely to uh, agree to things that are presented to us by people we're attracted to. We're more likely to do something. Um, we're more likely to do something if it's being, if everyone else is doing it. So my question is go online and here's what you have to do. There are those five principles. I'm asking you to go onto the internet. On the internet, there are millions of advertisements, millions and millions of advertisements. There are pictures, there are uh, videos, there's audio. What I'm asking you to do is find four different advertisements that employ some combination of these principles. Um, one, what I want you to do is just give me the link or attach the picture. Then two, I want you to write three to five sentences explaining which social psych principle that advertisement employs and why you say it does. So just to give an, an example, Say it's a perfume advertisement with a very attractive person on it. You could write up, um, this, so you put up this picture. I will draw a picture here of a very attractive person. That's a very attractive person. I write, this ad uses the halo effect. In particular, it gets me to form a positive opinion of the product by having an attractive person presented to me. That's, that would be one. And I'm asking you to do this four times. That's the nice side. Okay. That makes sense. Um, can I give that to you like Sunday then? Yes. Anybody, um, again, if you need extensions, anybody, just get it to me. Just let me know. And so, yes, yeah, Sunday's totally fine, Andre. Okay. Uh, and the second thing, sorry to interrupt you. Um, you didn't assign like a paper, right? I, the paper, and I was talking about this at the beginning. Um, the paper is due on December 17th. Well, yeah, the final paper. Yeah, the final paper. Yeah. Yep, that's it. There that's was no it. other, okay, okay, because there was like a- No other papers, that's it. Six okay. homeworks, those two final things, and then the final paper, and then the midterm, which you did. Okay, cool, sounds good. Yep. Thank you. Uh, all right, um, I'm going to stop the recording now. Anyone else? I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to stop class.